I would invite you to take your Bible this morning and open with me to the Song of Solomon. And if you would stand with me, we will read this passage together. And when I uh, conclude this reading, I am going to say the word of the Lord, and I would invite you to respond with the phrase, thanks be to God. So let's try that. The word of the Lord. Excellent. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Solomon presents uh, the king in the song who I don't think is the historical Solomon, I think it's an idealized version of Solomon, saying to his bride, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sanir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, And come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this text. And Lord, we pray that this text would transform our thinking about marital relations. And Father, I pray for every one of us in this room that none of us would fall into adultery and ruin a marriage and shipwreck a ministry. Lord, I pray that none of us would continue enslaved to pornography. And Father, I pray that none of us would import into marriage the world's approach to marital relations. Make it, Father, by the power of your Spirit, working through your Word, answering the prayer of Jesus, that you would sanctify us by your truth your true word. Lord, make it so that we are transformed in our thinking about human sexuality. And I pray that you would use these minutes that we have together to accomplish that in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I'm sure you're aware, cultural norms and expectations are more invasive in this culture in which we find ourselves than perhaps they've ever been able to be before with all of the various ways that 
that the evil one can target us with his snares. And at many, many points, so many of us and so many Christians are more conformed to the world than we are transformed, particularly when it comes to how we think about marital intimacy. So the question for us this morning is how to resist, how to, how to build a, a, a foundation in your thinking to resist the pervasive celebration of defilement in our culture. And, and what we want to find here in Song of Songs chapter 4 is a different way of thinking about what God intended for man and woman in marriage. So if you're here this morning and you're single and you're tempted to lust, this passage is going to speak to you. If you're here this morning and you're married and, and you're finding that worldly, lustful attitudes and desires are defiling the marriage bed, this passage is for you. This passage is to equip us to take our thoughts captive to the knowledge of Christ. So I think that Song of Songs is going to teach us how we're to think about marital relations. Let me say a word before we charge into this passage about how how I would interpret and approach the Song of Solomon more generally. Um, The first thing I would observe is that the primary background for this book is earlier Scripture. And, and, and what, we, what we want to recognize when we come to the Song of Songs is that the Song of Songs is a united poem. It's the Song of Solomon. It's one poem, and it's in the Bible. So this is a song in the Bible. And, you know, when you, when you come at a piece of poetry, you don't approach a piece of poetry the way that you approach an engineering textbook. You don't approach a piece of poetry the way that you approach a historical narrative. These things have different purposes, and they use different literary conventions. So this is a song in the Bible, and and the fact that it's not a historical narrative should keep us from thinking that this is strictly an autobiography about Solomon's own experience. I don't think that's what this passage is meant to reflect I think that in the song, as I mentioned earlier, Solomon is presenting an idealized version of himself, and and he's presenting us with a kind of impressionistic narrative that is intended to summarize and interpret the big story of the whole Bible. And this is what I mean by that. As early as Exodus 34, Israel is at Mount Sinai, Moses is on the mountain, as early as Exodus 34... Moses begins to warn the people of Israel not to whore after other gods. And that language and that metaphor communicates that the covenant that Yahweh has entered into with Israel is a marriage. And that if Israel goes and worships false gods, they will be committing spiritual adultery against the Lord. This means that that Moses can think of Yahweh as the husband and Israel as the bride. And then as you, as you continue through the Bible, you get to, to books like Hosea, where Hosea presents this kind of enacted drama, where he himself represents Yahweh, and his wayward bride, Gomer, represents Israel. And then, and then Jeremiah, you know, the New Covenant passage in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 says, days are coming when I will make a new covenant Uh, with them, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, uh, the covenant which they broke, and then the ESV renders it, I think correctly, though I was a husband to them. So this this metaphor of, of marriage to encapsulate the relationship between Yahweh and Israel is firmly entrenched in the Old Testament. You have it in authors prior to Solomon, and you have it in authors after Solomon. And and I would suggest that Solomon is doing something in the Song of Songs that is very similar to Psalm 45, where in that marriage song, really, the psalmist is addressing uh, the king of Israel, and, and he gets to, around, to about verses 5 or 6, and all of a sudden he identifies the king of Israel with Yahweh. 
addressing the king of Israel, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. It's almost as though the king of Israel is the earthly representative of the Lord, and then that would entail the covenant partner of the earthly representative of the Lord encapsulating within herself something like uh, being a symbolic representation of Israel. So, so I think that in the Song of Songs, Solomon means to present himself in, as Yahweh's representative, and, and then the bride is Israel. And then this impressionistic narrative, if we had time to walk through the whole thing, I would try to argue for you that in this impressionistic narrative, you have a kind of summary, a recapitulation, and, and a representation, which is summarizing and interpreting the whole history of the relationship between Yahweh and Israel. This fits perfectly with the idea that when the Messiah comes, he, he, he answers a question about fasting, saying, you don't fast when the bridegroom is here. And then they go to John the Baptist and they ask him about Jesus. And he says, the joy of the friend of the bridegroom is my joy. I hear the bridegroom's voice and I rejoice. And then, of course, you're aware of Ephesians 5 where Paul asserts that marriage is about the relationship between Christ and the church. So the Song of Songs is a poem in the Bible. And, and I would suggest to you that there is, there is a physical human marriage that is depicted unfolding across the song, poetically, not historically, and that marriage represents this, this reality of a spiritual covenant marriage between God and His people. As we move through the song, there, there's a kind of, of, of pattern, a kind of dynamic that unfolds. It, it, it often starts with the bride recognizing that she's separated from the king or, or she's somehow alienated from the king and, and then he speaks words to her that overcome the alienation and that, and that remove the separation. So in chapter 1, she's concerned about, his appearance, about her appearance, and he tells her that she is the most beautiful among women. She wants to know how she can have access to him and not be perceived as a prostitute, and he tells her exactly where she can find him. In chapter 2, there's a wall that separates them, and he invites her to come away. It's almost like an invitation for her to come and be his bride. And then in chapter 3, in a fascinating passage, that Lord willing, this is a unique occurrence, that here I am preaching at Southeastern this Thursday, and Tuesday I'm going to preach at Southern Seminary Chapel, and I'm going to preach Song of Songs 3, and in that passage, Solomon depicts the king himself entering into Jerusalem, and, and it's almost as though he's Yahweh himself. The bride asks in 3.6, who is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke? It, it's like the pillar of cloud and fire leading the people through the wilderness. And, and Solomon is being borne aloft on this sedan chair, this litter, this palanquin that's carried on, on these poles, uh, hefted on the shoulders of these men. And, and it's, it's almost like the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle traveling through the wilderness, entering into Jerusalem for 3.11. Go out, O daughters of Zion, look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. So, so Solomon comes up out of the wilderness like Yahweh coming up out of Egypt, and he's going to enter into Jerusalem for the consummation of the covenant between himself and his bride. What Solomon says to the bride is to transform how we think about marital relations. What we're going to see here in verses 1 through 7 is that Solomon is going to say to her that she is flowing with milk and honey. If you're taking notes, Song of Songs 4, 1 through 7, flowing with milk and honey. And then in verses 8 through 15, Solomon is going to speak of her as though she is yielding living water in a garden. So verses 1 through 7, flowing with milk and honey. Verses 8 through 15, living water in the garden. And then in 4.16 through 5.1, we see the consummation. Let's look together at Song of Songs 4, 1 through 7, where we see that she is flowing with milk and honey. Many interpreters look at this passage 
and, and they come at this and they try to find some point of contact between the way that Solomon describes the bride and her actual physical appearance. And I think that entirely misses the point. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure she was beautiful. I'm sure she was lovely. There's no question about that. But I don't think the point, for instance, of Song 4.1, where he says to her, your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead, is that she had dark hair and it was wavy. And it looked like a flock of goats. I don't think that's the point at all. So what is the point? Well, I think that what Solomon is doing is using imagery drawn from earlier Scripture that is meant to communicate what his bride means to him, what the, what the king in the song communicates the bride in the song means to him, not necessarily the historical Solomon about one of his historical wives. So let me, let me summarize the comparisons that we see in Song of Songs 4, 1 through 6. In verse 1, he compares her eyes to doves, her hair to a flock of goats, and then in verse 2, her teeth are likened to clean, shorn, fertile sheep. Verse 3, her lips are like a scarlet thread. And the only other place that we read of a scarlet thread, this phrase in the Bible, is in the account of the deliverance of Rahab at the fall of Jericho. And then in verse 3, also her cheeks, maybe her temples, we're not exactly sure uh, what that refers to, are likened to the, the halves of a pomegranate or fruit. So in these comparisons, in the first three verses of chapter 4 here, you've got birds, goats, sheep bearing twins, an allusion to the conquest of the land under Joshua, and then fruit. The king is describing the bride as though she is a land that is bursting with living creatures and fruit. And then in verse 4, he likens her neck to the tower of David built in rows of stone. And, and he references the shields of warriors. The point is not, again, that she has a long neck. Maybe you've seen those, those graphic kind of drawings that try to depict the woman this way. That's not the point. And, and the point is not that there's some correspondence, I don't think, between the shields and her jewelry or the rows of stones. No, the point is that she's like the land of promise. She's like the land of promise protected by the Davidic king. That's what Solomon is saying to this bride. So to think through this imagery... Let's, let's work back through the comparisons in a little bit more detail. Verse 1, the king says to the bride, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Now drop your eyes down to verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my love. That phrase at the beginning of verse 1 and the end of verse 7 is going to form a bracket, an inclusio around verses 1 through 7. So that's why I demarcated verses 1 through 7 off because I think... I think expository preaching is preaching where the main point of the text is the main point of the passage and preaching where the structure of the passage informs the structure of the sermon. So, so because of the structure of the passage, the literary structure of the passage, I think we have a unit in verses 1 through 7. And then he says to her, your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Now, as we ponder these comparisons, let me ask you, if, if you found yourself on the wedding day and you're eye to eye with your new bride, what would you use? What imagery would you employ to communicate the beauty and the significance of the beauty of your beloved? The imagery, as I've noted, that Solomon has chosen to use is imagery of a land that is sustaining life. There are birds and animals because the land is fertile, not barren. And, and the imagery is reminiscent of the Bible's depictions of the way that God is going to bless the land of Israel if the people of Israel will keep covenant. So if you go back and read the blessings of the covenant, you're going to be struck by how similar the description of the blessing of the land are with, with the imagery that Solomon uses here. He describes her, he starts with her head, eyes, hair, teeth. He, he starts with her head and he's going to work down her, her body and, 
And as he starts, he describes her eyes as doves. And if we, if we think of, of where we see doves in the Bible, I think one of the most prominent places would be, would be Noah sending out that dove off the ark. And, and if you're familiar with the Genesis narratives, you know that Noah is presented in those narratives like a new Adam who's entering after the flood into a new creation and, and God says, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. So it's almost as though Noah is a new Adam in a new creation in a new covenant with God. And, and this is subtly evoked by the reference to the doves because this is, this is the moment when a new covenant is going to be consummated between, between the king and the bride here. And, and, and then as I mentioned... The king compares her hair to the flock of goats. And and as we think about these comparisons, we want to remember that this is the song of songs. This is the most sublime song. Solomon wrote all this poetry, and the title of this one is saying, this is the best. This is the poem. This is the pinnacle of his poetic output. And this passage is building toward this climactic moment when when the king is going to enter into this sacred garden. And that is going to symbolize the consummation of this relationship where the king and the bride will enjoy anew a shameless nakedness before God. So I think in this passage, Solomon is using the language and the imagery of what matters most to him What matters most to Solomon, I know he was a sinner, okay? I know he blew it over and over again. And if he's depicting a kind of idealized version of himself in this song, then then you have an implicit confession of sin, acknowledgement of failure, repudiation of that approach to life, and and a kind of reassertion of God's good intentions. And Solomon is using language and imagery that depicts the kingdom of God under the blessing of God as the people of God walk in the law of God and enjoy the presence of God. Deuteronomy 28 describes the blessings of the, that the people will enjoy if they, keep, if they keep the Torah. And in Deuteronomy 28.4 we read, Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. So there's going to be fertility. They're, they're, going, to, they're going to bear children. I think this is why, verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. No doubt she wasn't toothless, right? Right? I'm sure she had every one of her teeth, but there's more to it than that. I think what Solomon is saying here is, poetically, you are like the blessing of God. You are like the opposite of Exodus 23.6, or, or, or you're the expression of Exodus 23.6, where the Lord says to Israel, none shall miscarry or be barren in your land. He sees her teeth, and he thinks of the way that, that there are no miscarriages under the blessing of of God. And if I'm right about all this imagery depicting the land of Israel under the blessing of God, the land of promise under the blessing of God, it would fit, wouldn't it, for there to be an allusion to Rahab in verse 3. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. According to Ruth 4 and Matthew 1, Rahab was Solomon's great, great, great grandmother. And so in a passage that depicts a poetic passage depicting the glory of God's purpose for human relations, for the redeemed to enjoy. How fitting that there would be an allusion to the mercy of God showed to Rahab, who was rescued from a life of harlotry, married, and became a mother in the line of the Messiah. This also adds an overtone of the conquest of the land. So Solomon is is very subtly suggesting that just as Israel inhabited the land, so also now he is going to take possession of this bride that God has prepared for him. She is lovely to him. As he says in the next line of verse 3, your mouth is lovely and she is to him like the fruit of the land. Your cheeks are like the halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. And this is a land that has a protector. This is a land 
Genesis 2.15, God put Adam in the garden to work it and keep it. This is a land that's being worked and kept because there's a Davidic king who has built a tower for the protection of his people. It's interesting, um, there, there's only one other place outside the Song of Songs where this Hebrew term dodi, that's rendered my beloved, it, and it's always used with reference to the king in the song. There's only one other place out the, outside the song where that term is used. It's in Isaiah chapter 5, where Isaiah says, let me sing a love song for my beloved. Guess who the beloved is? It's not Solomon, it's Yahweh. Guess what Yahweh's doing? He's, he's clearing a field, and he built a tower in it, and then he planted vines in it. It's imagery that's really similar to the Song of Songs. And, and I think it's possible that Isaiah is reading the Song of Songs along the lines of the way that I'm suggesting we should read the Song of Songs with the king representing Yahweh and the king's work in the land representing Yahweh's work among Israel. What he's saying to her when he describes this tower, he's saying to her, you are protected. The royal power of the Davidic king is ensuring your safety. So he's described her head and her neck in verses 1 through 4, and then he uses delicate and sacred imagery to speak of her chest in verse 5. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. A similar statement in Proverbs 5, 19. In, in Proverbs 5.19, the next words are, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. So, so both places, the imagery is of an elegant and graceful creature that describes the tender loveliness of the bride. And the bride's breasts will be the source of life for their children. So, so these healthy fawns connect the fruitfulness of the land and the fruitfulness of the bride. Opposite in Hosea 9.14, where there's a reference to a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. So the king of Israel is, is celebrating his bride's beauty, and it's interesting, the, the term for gazelle here is a homonym. A homonym is a word that uh, can be spelled the same way, but it, it has multiple meanings. And, and so the word gazelle, the Hebrew term tzavi, it, 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 it means beauty. And so what, what Solomon uses here is the feminine form of the Hebrew word that means beauty, tzaviya. And so it's like he's saying when he says that, that her breasts are twins of a gazelle, these are the twin daughters of beauty. That's what, that's what she looks like to him. And, and they graze among the lilies. The, the, this, these, these fawns, they don't just eat roughage out in the pasture. They eat a cultivated land. You can welcome these, these fawns into the flower garden and you don't have to try to run them off. Verse 6, he says, until the day breathes and the shadows flee. I think that's a, a, a reference to the, the cool of the day in which God walked with man in Genesis 3.8. This invokes that Edenic situation. And then he says, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. These two um, um, spices, oils, myrrh and frankincense, were used in the special anointing oil made to anoint the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 30. And the Garden of Eden is spoken of elsewhere in Ezekiel 28, 14 as, as a holy mountain. So, so this is going to call in connotations of the anointing of the tabernacle and the holy mountain of the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. It lends a sacred shade to the light that emanates from this passage. It, it's as though Solomon is presenting the king saying that the body of his bride is like the Garden of Eden. Sacred space. Only to be enjoyed by those who are authorized to do so. When we talk about the Song of Solomon, when we preach and teach this book, I think we should use the same reverence and decorum that Solomon himself uses. And that same reverence and decorum should be accorded to the bodies of all women. When we go to think about human marital relations, 
We need to get our minds out of the gutter. We don't need to be informed by what we've seen online. We don't need to be informed by what we've read in some wretched periodical. We need to be informed by the scriptures. This is sacred. It's holy. It's like the holy of holies. Verse 7, as I've said, he repeats the words of verse 1. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There's no flaw in you. And then after addressing her beauty, verses 8 through 15, he's going to invite her to come with him, and then he's going to describe her as the Garden of Eden. So, so it's as though, if you, if you follow the kind of impressionistic narrative, at the end of chapter 3, he comes up from the wilderness into Jerusalem, and then he, he summons her to come down from Lebanon in verse 8 and depart from the, the peak of Amana. These are all places up uh, north of the land of Israel. Verse 9, you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. He's euphoric over her. He is enraptured by her. And what matters most to him is reflected in the way that, she, that, the way that he speaks of her. We want to pray for the Lord to deliver us from the filth of our culture We want to pray for the Lord to renew our minds. We want to fight to drive the world's lingo and the world's ways of approaching these things out of our thinking. And we want to take our thoughts captive to Christ. So, husbands in this room, don't think of your wife's beauty, her sacred spaces, in fleshly ways. Think of them like this. Marriage is about Christ and the church. We want to think about it that way. We want to think and talk about marriage as though it corresponds to what matters most to us. So I would I would I would invite you to think about if you were going to adapt Solomon's imagery to your context, what would it look like? I think I know what it would look like to uh, Brother Marita. If if, I think if if Tony was going to say to his wife, I'm going to use the imagery of Song of Solomon adapted to a new covenant context. I bet he would say something like this. Your face is a visible expression to me of the blessing of God on his people. And when I see you, I'm reminded that I'm redeemed and given a life I don't deserve. And nothing matters more to me than Jesus and his kingdom. And by God's grace, our marriage is enacting these most important things in the world. When I gaze on your beauty... It's like standing in the pulpit and looking out on a church full of people saying, Pastor, keep preaching to us. Give us the word of God. What a blessed thing. Our union is like a trip into the new Jerusalem where righteousness dwells. When we come to verse 9, it's like the king and the bride are eye to eye. He speaks of, of her eyes there. There's a lot to see here, and our time is slipping away. So, so what I want to do is I want to skip down to verse 12, and I want to draw your attention to the way that verses 12 and verse 15 are again bracketed. Verse 12, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Look down at verse 15, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. So the, the references to the garden and the fountain are in verses 12 and verse 15 bracket this section. And in between, what he does is he describes delights of the garden that God planted in the east where a river flowed through to water the garden. Brothers and sisters, if you will think of marriage this way, you won't be able to despise and disregard your spouse. If you'll see the cosmic significance of marriage the way that marriage is depicting the gospel, Christ laying down his life for his bride, anticipating the great consummation of the purposes of God, you know, the Revelation 19, 7 and 8, the marriage feast of the Lamb, you won't be able, you won't be able to lust after the wife or the potential wife of someone else. You won't be able to sin against the Lord if you will hide his word in your heart, if you will think of marriage and your beloved in these terms. 
It's, it's interesting. He says in verse 13 there, your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates. The word rendered orchard there is the word that we get our English word paradise from. So it's almost like a paradise of pomegranates. And then I just want to draw your attention to the way that he says in verse 11, your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And then he speaks it, here in, of, of all these, these spices uh, when he speaks of nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon. And then when, when the consummation comes, she, she, I think she begins to speak at verse 16, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. And then when the consummation, what he says in 5.1 is, I gathered my myrrh with my spice. He said he was going to the mountain of myrrh in verse 6. Now he's gathered the myrrh. I ate my honeycomb. He had said in verse 11, your lips drip nectar, honey and milk are under your tongue. I drank my wine with my milk. All those things that he's described her as embodying, he is now enjoying at the consummation. This is a beautiful and delicate way to speak of this glorious reality. It, it is expressive and it's restrained. It is suggestive, but it is in no way indecent. And the glory of what's described is matched by the glory of the description. And the nature of the description adds to the glory of what is described. I have a friend who um, refers to himself as a gourmand. A more pedestrian way to say that is that he's a foodie. And we were once on a trip... And um, he was reading a book about fine food and about gourmands. And, and he, he shared with me a quote uh, uh, that this French author, um, it was attributed to this French author whose name I can't pronounce, so I'm not going to try. Th- this guy said this, Animals feed. Man eats. The intelligent man alone knows how to eat. Something like that's at work here in the book of the Song of Solomon. Any beast can reproduce. Only human beings, only those made in the image and likeness of God, those being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus, can experience what's depicted in this passage. And then I agree with Dr. Aiken that the last words of verse 1 of chapter 5, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love, are spoken by the Lord himself. So so I would just encourage you to include in your concept of God the idea that he wants this holy, sacred relationship within marriage to be enjoyed to the full. That doesn't mean you, you, you take Canaanite practices and you do those within the context of marriage. No, no. It means you conduct yourself as you would in the Garden of Eden, naked and without shame, before the Lord of hosts. Maybe you've been married and it's fallen apart and it doesn't look like this. Maybe you're divorced or you're single. Maybe you're, you're not married and for some sad reason you never will be. Maybe you're, maybe you're attracted to people of the same sex and you see a passage like this and you think that would be great. It'll never be my experience. I would say to you, I can say to you with confidence that if you trust in Christ, if you're His, if you claim His death as your death, His resurrection as your life, you walk by faith in Him, you commit yourself to holy abstinence and faithfulness to Him, you'll be loved this way. You'll be loved this way and better. You'll be loved in a way that, that this passage only anticipates and points forward to. Because what what Solomon depicts in Song of Songs 4 will be fulfilled in the consummation of the relationship between Christ and his church. So we want to trust the Lord Jesus. And everything that this passage points to will be ours when he makes all things new. Let's pray. Father, we can't do this for ourselves. We can't renew our own minds. We can't make it so that So that in the moment of temptation, the Holy Spirit 
brings to mind your word. Lord, we can prepare, we can flee, we can do many things, but Lord, we need you. We need you to remind us in that moment of need of what it is that we're longing for, what it is that we're living for, and what it is that these these things that Satan would twist and pervert and use to lead us to destruction, what it is that these precious things are about. So Lord, I pray that you'd do it. I pray that you'd make us holy. I pray that you'd use your word to transform our thinking. Make it so that we don't want the world's version. Lord, we love you. We want to live for you. We want to we want to see your glory in our relationships. And so we, we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.